Hey there, Sandra. Welcome to the Making Math Moments That Matter podcast. We are super excited uh, to have you here uh, to talk all things uh, math, but uh, specifically about your area of expertise. Um, but uh, before we dig in and before we get there, uh, let our listeners know uh, where you come from. Sounds like uh, a storm is approaching. Yeah. Uh, but uh, and then also just a, give us give uh, our listeners a little insight of uh of, of, you know, what, what field you're currently working in and uh, in your role in education. Okay. Yes, I live in Florida and today we're expecting Idalia to hit. So a cat three hurricane, but I grew up here. So all's good. Everything's battened down, nothing to go flying around. <laughs> uh, as far as how, where I am in education, I'm the chief academic officer for Touch Math. So it's a 48 year old special ed mathematics company. Um, and I basically, as the chief academic officer, I get to work with a phenomenal team of current and former educators supporting districts who have students who are struggling with math, either because they have a disability, like we're going to talk about, or because they've had excessive absenteeism or mm -hmm. varieties go on and so they're temporarily, temporarily struggling. Awesome. That is, that is fantastic. And, you know, we definitely want to dig in and learn all about that. Now you are working for a company, a spec ed company that does focus on mathematics specifically. Uh, so that's why you're here. And uh, before we dig in, we've got to roll all the way back into your past and ask you, what would you say is that math moment that is still with you from your own uh, learning experience as a student? Can it be a bad one? Yeah, sure. Lots of people share those. Let's be, lots of people which share bad ones. Which is really, it, it highlights Mine's sadly, bad. Mine's bad too. Yeah. And it, and it highlights sadly, like the, the state of mathematics education in general. Right. And I think, yeah. you know, sharing that it, it just helps to drive more educators, more math moment makers out there to say like, we've got to change this, you know, something needs to change. If, if the majority of these moments are negative, uh, mm -hmm. then we can't be surprised when so many people say that math was not their favorite subject, or in many cases, it was their least favorite subject. So share away and uh, don't hold anything back. Won't. Okay. No, mine was one of those, I was one of those kids that, you know, it's kind of like no math brain, which I'm hoping we can talk about too, because that's like, oh. Mm -hmm. um, but so I grew up, decided that at the ripe old age of them being in my forties, I wanted to go for a PhD. So, of course, I thought I would take the great route of doing a qualitative, but the chair said, no, you're going to do a quantitative. You can talk rings around people. You're going to do the math. And it's like, uh -huh, total freeze. And I'm sitting here going, I'm an elementary yeah. principal. I know my profession, but math, I mean, terrified. And when he told me I had to take statistics mm -hmm. as a grad oh my student gosh. with a, yeah, go into a room, then it's all people who are wanting to get their degrees and be psychologists and statisticians. Yeah. I felt that I felt like a total idiot. I didn't mm. know anything. It made no sense. I froze every single class. I scraped by, but that just sort of turned the tide. It's kind of like, there is no way that I can be dumb at math. Why does it not make sense? So I pretty much started picking up the baton and studying and trying to, to find out and encourage other people, what is it that is so terrifying about math, hmm. but literacy. So it has yeah. taken me on this path. And so I'm thrilled to be here with you guys, because from what I could tell from listening to a lot of your podcasts, you're on the same page I am. Awesome. Math deserves equal attention as literacy. It is critical for kids to have a mastery of math so that they can have their dream careers and it just does not get the attention that literacy does. And if you happen to have the learning disability for math, dyscalculia, nobody knows what it is. Everybody right. knows what dyslexia is, but it, not it, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I, I'm a little curious. I want. I, I'm, cu I'm curious about your your transition where you walked into that that classroom or that stats that stats class and you felt that fear. You felt you probably the inadequacy. The, the I'm in the wrong spot. And you said something key that that I wanted to kind of learn a little bit more. You said like you decided to kind of like dig down and like make it a priority. But like, what do you think? Like, what was it that pushed you over the edge to be like, no, I gotta, I gotta do this? Because a lot of a mm -hmm. lot of people would still shy away from 
from that math and go like, I'm just going to get through this. It's not going to be something I need to like dig down and double down on. So I'm curious about like, what was it, what was going through your mind or what was your, your, your mindset to kind of push you in the direction of, of kind of moving down the, the math, the math, uh, you know, building your math confidence. Research articles, having one come across, you know how sometimes you'll pick up something and read it and you go, Oh, this makes perfect sense. It explains mm. so much. Is this an anomaly? Let me go see if there's others out there. And at that time, people were starting to talk about math anxiety and how it could freeze working memory. And so you couldn't access what you needed. And the fact that there is no such thing as a math brain. So I think it was going in and doing the research going, there is no such thing. I have been fooling myself. I can do this. And there, that mindset, that positive mindset that I can, but I had to start back from the beginning. And then I got mm. very, very lucky and couple years later was able to be in at the start of engage, the Engage New York process. When we, oh, love it. Yeah. I was able to sit at the feet of the people from LSU and I think it was UNC and all of the teachers that were actually talking and writing the curriculum and going, this is not how I was taught mathematics. This is not how my teachers and I are teaching mathematics in our schools. I'm going, this makes total sense. So hmm. then I started digging into the neuroscience about how humans learn mathematics and the fact that it's a survival trait. We're born with it. So it's like, okay, there is no math brain. So it's just been this constant evolution and finding that more and more is out there to support it, but it's not general knowledge. Hmm. It's still a massive myth. So one of the things that I'm excited about being with you guys is, can we all help proselytize and convince others that this is one of those things we need to address because it is hurting a lot of children and it has Absolutely. held a lot of people back from what they they can do and were their dreams. Uh, it's, it, it's so true. You said so many key pieces there and, you know, just uh, speaking to Engage New York, which became Eureka and, yes. uh, you know, actually uh, Dr. Baldwin uh, and I have, have co-presented at a, a couple conferences. Uh, fantastic, fantastic you know, math education and, and just mathematician in general yes. as well. Like he, he's, he's brilliant when you get into yep. those conversations. The fact that he has such a depth of understanding in mathematics in such an abstract world, I, yep. I find it fascinating that he's able to come back to uh, where a child is and to be able to help them along that trajectory, which I, I find that sometimes people have a hard time once they get too far down that path. Uh, you know, that, that can be a struggle. So definitely great. So, uh, you know, awesome to hear that you were a part of that process. And then, you know, just highlighting, you know, I don't know if you've had an opportunity to do so, but we talk about six parts of what we call our math program tree. Yes. And one part is the mindset and the beliefs, like one of the key pieces. It, it's, it's not an afterthought. It's not something that's nice to do, or, you know, a feel good thing. It's like, it is necessary work in order, and we call it the sun, soil, and water of our tree, because without it, the tree will will essentially die, right? It will starve and it will it will not grow and it will not be strong. So, you know, that piece is so key. And there's so many people out there, and in particular, there are even many educators out there who have this belief. And you were talking about, you know, the the way that math was taught, but in reality, when math is taught in the way that you have articulated in your own experience, what that does is that creates the belief that that's what math is. And the reality is, is that is not mathematics. That is, that is one part of a story that we have told ourselves. And now that story for so many kids is a reality when in reality, and, and those kids obviously become adults and, and here we are, and we're just repeating that process. So I think it's fantastic that you've taken it upon yourself, like so many others in the math ed space to do something about it. So I'm wondering, you know, can you take us down a little bit of a path here and, you know, uh, take us down the work that you're, you're engaging in now and what does that look like and sound like? So it sounds like you're going to define a term for us here. And, and can you tell us a little bit more about it, this dyscalculia and the fact that everyone knows dyslexia, you had already referenced this, but yet 
even two math guys, me and John are going like, we're like, I think I've read about that in research before, but I don't know if I could 100% define it. Like that's actually pretty sad uh, in reality, right? So tell us a little bit more about it and let's bring all of our math moment makers okay. up to up to speed. Well, and, and I have to say, John and Kyle, that that is sad because I was assuming that you would know what it was. So mm -hmm. I go all over the world and because of this research that I've been doing and my team's been doing, I literally got started on this by asking people, you know, if I asked you if you like reading, what would you say? Right. Everybody raises their hands. Do you like math? Very few people in a room will raise their hands. So I said, do you have any friends that would admit that they don't like to read? Nobody raised their hands. Do you have friends who say they just don't like math? They suck at it. They'll avoid it at all costs. Everybody's hands go up. And I'm going, interesting. So if I ask you what dyslexia is, do you know what it is? Almost 100%. Right. All right. the time. Everywhere. Dyscalculia, maybe a hand goes up. And so I thank them for proving my point, which is that math is not important. Mm -hmm. so you would never admit to being illiterate, nope. not being able to read, but it's perfectly okay to say that you can't do math. Yeah. It's, it's socially okay. acceptable. It's socially it's acceptable. Socially acceptable. And, and it's like a pride of a lot of people. It's a, it's a badge of honor yeah. to say I'm bad at math. You yeah, know, I'm in that group. And, and it's okay. I'm actually, I'm bad at math and that's, I'm proud of it, which is, which is, is, which is crazy because you're right. No one says I, I, you know, they might say, I don't like to read, right. but it's like, I'm, I'm like, I, I, oh, I can't read. That's not, it's not something I'm proud of, you know? Right. But part of that mindset has led to the fact that if you can't read parents and everybody will really try hard to find out, do you have the specific learning disability dyslexia? And they'll do early screenings. I mean, right. Eight of our states now have laws, early screening, intervention, immediately starting in pre-K or K. That mindset, I believe, of it's okay to be enumerate, not like it, struggle with it. You know, I was bad at it, so my kid's going to be bad at it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's helped lead us to a gross underdiagnosis of a specific learning disability that has the same prevalence, 3 to 7%, according to, to the research. So you've got all these students who have this specific learning disability, and it's a neurodevelopmental disorder. It, you're born with it, just like dyslexia. You can find it early. It does not have a cure, but the research is very clear. The consensus is that this is a neurodevelopmental disorder, primarily comprising um, poor development or disruption in the myelin sheath, the neural pathways in the regions of the brain where mm -hmm. we processing and we solve math very addressable you can screen for it and find it at three years of age you can target those areas of math number sense math facts calculation and mathematical reasoning if you target those with interventions mm -hmm. children with dyscalculia can have the same academic growth mm. that the typically developing peer has you know and i'd love to take you down the rabbit hole of the myelin sheath and neuroplasticity but it's Practice makes that yeah. work. So these children can do math, but yeah. yet. So, it, so it's like the growing of those neural pathways. Is that essentially what's happening? Yeah. In, the myelin in sheath, you know, the fat that goes around it that allows yeah. the signals to flow. If it's got disruptions in it or it's not fully developed, it's too thin, the signals hmm. are very slow. So students with this calculator are often slow at solving problems. They, they know what three plus three is today. Tomorrow, they don't. Right. So working memory issues, their spatial relationship issues, all of those things. But we know from watching it with the fMRIs, there's some research that shows here's the student with dyscalculia. The brain is moving at this speed. The mm -hmm. neurons are firing. Uh, here's the typically developing peer moving at a completely different speed. You go through practice. You do the teaching. You give them the time. Do the fMRI again. And guess what? The speed is almost exactly the same. And over time, it can approximate. So it's like, hmm. this is very addressable. There is no right. need for this. We just have to identify these children. Yeah. And early screening and intervention absolutely works. Yeah. That was a, well, I went. Well, well yeah, no, no this I, is great. Like, like I, 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 I want to, yeah, I, well, this is, this is perfect. So, so it is amazing that, you know, we have these, 
we have these interventions in place. We have we have these next steps that we can do. We have, we have proof that we can make it better, just like some of the other, um, you know, learning disabilities that students have have been identified with. And once we yeah. identify them with, we do have a pathway for them to feel success in in a yes. certain area. And you're you're right; it's completely uh, in literacy. It's 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 a huge thing, right? Like it, it's a big thing for an educator to watch out for some some signs and. And it's not, you know, in mathematics. And do you think, like, do you think this mass mass underdiagnosis is is because of teachers not knowing, or or teachers also having the same mindset that the rest of the public have? Like, some kids are good at math and some kids aren't, and because of that that belief that the mass public have or has. Like it, it's something that we don't even watch for anymore. It's because like, oh, you're just one of those, you know, not so great at math and that's okay. Mm -hmm. You're going to grow up. And, and there's get, nothing we can you, do about it, right? You'll it's get, you'll, the belief. you'll get by, you'll get by. But if you can't read, we're going to do everything under our power to like make that happen. But it's okay if you don't get, you know, better at math because you only need up to grade six to be successful in life. And like, there's all these things like that float, right? It's so it's like, is it the mass? Is it because we just don't know, or is it because of mostly mindset? Like, what is your experience on on kind of feeling that out? That's a great question, and I was thinking it through. It's both, right? You know, we've got a cultural mindset that's been in place for generations. You know, boys are better at math than girls. Um, I was bad at math. My kids going to be bad at math. Yeah. They were born with a math mind. They're just they're natural at it. And because there's also lack of awareness of the fact that that's a pseudo myth, you know, it's pseudo, is that even a word? It's, you know, it's it is a, now. It's yeah. a math <laughs> now. I'm known from inventing them. It's a math myth. And since nobody talks about this particular learning disability, you've got both things sort of interacting together and making it much, much worse. Mm. And yet, the whole world is going, we need STEM jobs. Well, you can't do STEM. That M stands for mathematics is last time I checked. And yet we're cutting out a lot of children, one from the cultural belief that you're born with math or not. So mm -hmm. that takes in the kid who's struggling too. My dad and mom are saying, it's okay to make a C or a D. I'm not even going to think about being an engineer when in fact it's a matter of instruction. Um, and without the diagnosis, you've got 7% of the kids. There's nothing wrong with their IQ. This calculia has nothing to do with that. So they could have had their issue addressed also. Maybe they wanted to be a nurse and you can't be a nurse, especially in the UK, I found out, unless you pass the math portion of your final exam. And unless you have the diagnosis, you're not allowed to take any accommodations into the test. Mm. So I'm sitting here going, I ran into that a couple of months ago in London, a professor coming up and asking me these questions. And I said, I hate to tell you this, but you just described classic dyscalculia in an adult. They need to go have the diagnosis to have the legal protection because these young men and women, there was like four of them, had gone through two years of training. And if they fail the test, they don't get the license. Their entire career dream goes down the tube. So mm -hmm. long answer, John, I think it's both. And they have interacted. And because mm -hmm. we don't have a Tom Cruise or some other um, media personalities out there going, I have dyslexia, you know, right. I have to do things this way, but I can still be a famous actor. Right. We need to find people who will step forward and, and bring attention to it because that's when things happen. You guys yeah. are gonna be part of that. So I'm, I'm recruiting you to the cause. We need to get math equivalent to literacy. Right. And we need to bring some attention to this underdiagnosed disability because it can be addressed. 100%. And you know, I, I definitely, I, I had a funny feeling you were going to say that it is both. And that is, um, I guess a sad reality. And I, I might even argue that there's maybe even a hierarchy because until that belief shifts and, yeah. and the, the mindsets shift around, you know, this, some are math people, some are not. And, and there has been a, a tremendous amount of work, you know, I'll, I'll shout out, you know, Dr. Joe Bowler has, yeah. has raised a lot of attention around mindsets and math mindsets and helping people to sort of see and enter into that world. That is massively important. The part that really scares me is until that happens, we won't get to an awareness piece around 
this challenge, you know, and, and this, this learning disability that, that so many students are, you know, are dealing with. And when you, uh, when you think about that, I, I guess what worries me the most about this is that even though reading and literacy in general has such a massive focus, we still haven't done a really great job at addressing that challenge, right? So if you really think about that, even though there's been way more effort, way more funding, way more attention, yeah. yet we're still dealing with a massive amount of students who are struggling in literacy. And it's like, I, I my worry here, and this is kind of pleading to the Math Moment Maker audience, is that it's going to take not only time for us to shift those beliefs and the mindsets to build an awareness around this challenge, but then to actually get a solution going to start helping students. I worry about like how far down the road are we going to be? You think about the reading journey, how long that journey has been, and we still have challenges despite knowing what we know. And here we are decades behind in mathematics. And that to me is, is really when we talk about equity and we talk about the importance of access and equity in education and mathematics specifically, this is this is obviously a massive, massive issue. So I'm wondering if we were to start, you know, sort of shifting here, you're talking to an audience of people who are doers, right? Like these are people who are on their walk right now, listening to math education right now. How do I become a better teacher, a better math leader, a better administrator? These are people who are like going to be the doers, the people that you're after here to, to get this message out to. So my wonder is, it's like, what is something that they can do. And, you know, what are some options you had mentioned about screening, what popped into my mind here, which is really important early. We know early intervention, be it math or reading or sorry, math or literacy is key early intervention of anything in health. And, you know, everything is so key. You talked about by the age of three, that we could yeah. actually start to identify students who were born with this challenge. Yes. And my wonder is, what does that look like and sound like? How can we give our math moment makers maybe some actionable steps that they might be able to bring back into their math communities? Okay. So early screening, early intervention makes for better achievement. On the screening, it we released one because we couldn't find one that met our needs. As far as me being a former SPED teacher and SPED administrator, there are some out there. Um, there's the new early numeracy screener. There's Butterworth screener over in the UK, but they go after very specific things and they're aimed more at, at the therapist, I believe. We aimed ours at the parent and the teacher who sees the kids struggling and has to gather data in order to take it to the diagnostician because that's the end audience, the person who can actually give a formal diagnosis of specific learning disability, math, dyscalculia. So the screening takes about less than 10 minutes, a parent or a teacher can do it. It also incorporates a survey because the school psychologist or diagnostician is always gonna ask, does the child speak a different language? That could be the cause of the math. Do they, have they had a vision or hearing screening? That could be causing the math issues. And then it's the observational data that really feeds the process that you can see in a three-year-old. Um, you ask them to go and get three biscuits they have no idea what that is. You ask, count, try and count something out, they do not know it. Older children, problems with appointments and everything. So getting your hands on a screener. So one of the things mm -hmm. that we're doing such math to raise awareness is the screener is fully subsidized. We're not collecting any data. It is out there and free for everybody to use. So if there's a suspicion on the part of a parent or a teacher, do the screening. Find out if the child falls mm. in a definitely risk factors some or none, but if there's a concern there, start to do something. Mm -hmm. And then we added to the screener the fact that there are a lot of interventions that we can do. Taking right. a page out of the book for dyslexia, read to your child, talk to your child, you know, talk about vocabulary words and what something means. Math is even more fun to do. Counting songs, which is faster, which is slower, all sorts of things that we can do. Can you figure out the tip at the restaurant? Things that a parent or a teacher can do just normally while we wait to see if there is going to be mm -hmm. a diagnosis. So, and those interventions all are just flat out good practice. I was just going to say, it sounds like good math 
you know, yeah. oftentimes yeah, this that's is, the best way to address access and equity, right? Is good is exactly. instruction and good practices. I, yeah. yeah. And, and I'm, I'm wondering two things. Um, I actually, I'm wondering about a bunch of things, but, uh, two things first, um, so when you're talking about a, a, a screener, your screener in particular, um, you mentioned, you know, if you had a suspicion that a child um, might, you know, might have have a, a learning disability around this area, like what, like, like let's say I'm a teacher, let's say I'm in the kindergarten classroom, um, or let's say I'm in grade one classroom, and is there something that we should be like, that's that's a trigger, you know, like that's something that I should be like, oh, I should, like the classic I should sign like, or, or is like, or, or is it, or is a good practice? This is probably a good practice is that everyone does the screener. And then I, I can get some results from there to go like, where should I focus some of my extra effort to address this issue? Or maybe we should recommend this person gets tested. But, but if I'm not doing a screener to everybody, is there some, some telltale signs that I should be keeping an eye out to go like, ah, that's, that's one of those things that I should, should kind of watch for. Okay, John, there's two, two paths here. One is if you're already in a system where you do universal screening. So an iReady, a MAPS, uh, there's right. any number of those where every child gets a blanket screening to sort of see where they are in their grade level. And a lot of them are now starting at K. There's usually a demarcation line for we're going to predict if the child is at the 40th percentile and below, probably when that high stakes test comes up in third grade, they're not going to show proficiency. Um, that's a good group to start with. The nice thing about what we've learned in the research about this Calculia, since it's primarily based on the inability, a poor ability to do number sense, facts, calculation, and mathematical reasoning, those are the four foundational those are the first steps in learning mathematics. So it doesn't matter if you have the dyscalculia, that's gonna be you know about 7% yep. of the population, but there's a huge chunk of kids there that you can find indicators on that it's like, okay, I can intervene in kindergarten. This child's perfectly you know, typical, no signs of dyscalculia, but cannot, uh, is still using their fingers when they shouldn't be, cannot give me what two plus two is, cannot remember that, three comes after two, things like that. Totally. I can still intervene with them so that when they have, they can be on grade level and moving with their peers instead of getting more and more behind. And it's not really found and proven until third grade. Mm. So that was sort of like, I think I answered it. It's mm -hmm. too no, this is, approach. yeah, that, that, that's massively helpful. And, and again, it kind of brings me back to this idea of like good practice allows you to not only help this group, you know, yes. of up to 7% of, of the population, but also there are, there's a vast, you know, a much larger percentage, I would argue yes. that are struggling with many of the yes. same things. And wait a second, their brain is probably even more primed to receive the intervention. That's going to help yes. the student that actually has this challenge and yes. You know, to me, it, it just seems like good practice in general. And, you know, you had highlighted there's, there's, I think maybe a little bit of a confusion out there in the math education community where, you know, we push so much around this idea of investigations and problem solving and critical thinking and like all of these things, which are really, 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 really important, especially as we go out into the real world. But the reality is, is that we need the fundamentals as well. And there are things that just require some repetition and practice. And it doesn't have to be repetition with a timer necessarily where the student knows there's a timer, but sometimes timers are helpful for us as the educator to determine, is there a challenge here, right? Because if it takes this student five times longer than it took that student, that's a red flag. And I need to actually be aware of that. And, you know, I really love how you're, you're highlighting here. And like, to me, it sounds like, Hey, if a student's struggling with their number sense and their fact fluency, like those are key pieces that we need to build. And we talk, to talk about the tree's roots, the content knowledge and the actual understanding of the mathematics that is going to be uh, hindered if students don't get that fluency and flexibility, you know, at a developmentally appropriate age, right? Like that's going to constantly be holding them back. And that working memory, regardless of if you have a challenge or not, 
eventually your, your working memory needs to be freed up to do some more deliberate, more intentional, more uh, abstract thinking. So I'm loving that. Tell us a little bit more about, you know, so I'm a teacher, I'm listening and I'm going, wow, sounds like Sandra here has a great tool for me to leverage that will not only identify the up to 7% of my students that may actually be struggling with this, this challenge, but I could also be helping a larger percentage of my students at the same time. What does it look like and sound like if they were to go and actually, you know, try to take you up on that offer? They're like, I want to check this thing out and I want to try it on my own children first, or I want to try it with a group of students. What does that look like and sound like? And sort of what do they, we'll call it, call it what do they get from, I, I think you had said it's a free screen. Yeah. So you go to www.touchmath.com. The disc test is there. You just click on it and use it. Since we're not saving it, you need to make sure you download it and save the report. And then you look at the interventions and I really wanna call them out because you were talking about best practice and it really is some of the key ones. Multisensory, the brain doesn't use one section to do math. It pulls in motor, it pulls in vision, it pulls in hearing. So you gotta do multisensory when we're teaching mathematics. You have to use manipulatives. You know, we the concrete representational abstract continuum, the framework, that's how the human mind builds those memories to do it. Um, you have to do explicit systematic instruction. Yes, the exploration is going to happen and that's great. But sometimes, like you said, it's just, it's direct instruction. I have to start and model it for you, mm -hmm. do it side by side, and then I'm going to let you practice all those repeated opportunities that are, I think, a phenomenal way to describe practice. So all of that's out there. That's part of what we've built into our program. That's why we're a special ed math curriculum. And you know, I've got 28 years worth of efficacy studies because we have focused on what the research says is best practice, built in the multisensory and the manipulatives, but it works for more than just the SPED students. It works for the student who's struggling temporarily so they can, they'll jettison it. So it's kind of like, you know, yes, we would love to have this as the first step in raising awareness. Mm -hmm. We're 20 years behind dyslexia, yep. but we know what they did to make it so obviously well recognized we can do the same thing and speed up the process so and a lot of it Love is it. just sitting out there and you know my colleagues your colleagues we talk about it that's the first step in any kind of campaign to bring notice to something that can be solved yeah that i think you've you've given us a a, a, a lot of information to think about I, I think you've given us some practical um, next steps uh, by heading over to touchmath.com and, and, and grabbing the screener and, and thinking about how, how we can effectively use that in our classrooms, in our schools, you know, principals and, and district leaders are listening as well. Think about implementing that in your schools. So that's that's been, you know, as I said, very practical and, and, and great because I think this is such an important uh, important topic that we need to be addressing in our classrooms, and it has to start with teachers and school leaders to make this make this uh, you know a priority in our buildings. Sandra, if there was one one big idea, one last uh, you know insight you could leave with the audience right now, our teacher audience, our our leader audience, what would that be? Uh, okay, it's got three 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 pieces to it. Screen early intervene immediately. And we all know the interventions. We were taught them at university. We just need, need to be more deliberate about bringing forward those practices that we have and using them with deliberate, deliberate thought and looking at the data. I love it. I love it. Those are awesome. three awesome takeaways. That idea, this deliberate, intentional, we use yes. that word a lot here on the podcast being intentional about what you do. And, and you know, I, I just want to share a, a quick takeaway um, from what we've learned. And I want to thank you for bringing us up to speed because again, we know, you know, we've heard of dyscalculia and we knew in general what it's all about, but we didn't understand how it actually worked, right? How mm -hmm. we can actually identify it and yes. what we can actually do to help students overcome those challenges. So I want to thank you on behalf of the Making Math Moments That Matter podcast. Uh, you've you've brought us all up to speed. You've raised awareness. And I just want to thank, uh, thank you on behalf of 
all students everywhere in trying to raise the awareness. And you've just given us one more tool in our arsenal when we are working with school districts, for example, in order to, again, shine the light on mathematics because it is so key. And the research tells us that, hey, when we focus on mathematics, literacy also benefits positively, whereas the opposite is not necessarily true. So thank you so much. Thank um, you guys very hey, much. Sandra, this has been a pleasure. Uh, we will put the link to uh, touchmath.com in our show notes. Um, I'm assuming there's probably some social media links that we'll add probably at touch math. I'm going to guess unless you've got some other ones to share here and uh, we're hoping to check in with you, uh, you know, at some point in the future. I would love to because March 3rd is Dyscalculia Awareness Day. So anything we can do well in October is Specific Learning Disability Awareness Month. So anything you guys can do with your your featured guests and stuff to sort of highlight those couple of dates. And I'd love to come back if, you know, if you're willing and the uh, creek don't rise. So I'm looking behind me at the water slowly rising. So but thank you so much. This was this was totally enjoyable. Love, oh, it. That's Love awesome. it. We had a great time. And uh, thanks again for for joining us. OK, thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. Take care.